Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With it being 7 o'clock, we will make a start. Uh, a warm welcome to those attending and also to our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Healing in London. This is a meeting of the Residents' Education and Environmental Services Policy Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Wayne Bridges and I'm the Chairman of this meeting. The key role of this committee is to monitor the performance of local public services within its remit and to hold in-depth reviews on topics of resident interest. We engage with a range of external witnesses in our activity, which can include community groups, residents and subject matter experts. Where we identify areas for change or improvement, we make recommendations to the decision-making cabinet. Details of the business to be considered today are shown on the agenda, copies of which are available in the room and also accessible on the YouTube channel underneath the broadcast. For those present in the room and intended to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made public. And for those in the public gallery, you will not be on camera. A reminder to councillors, officers and those speaking today that you should turn your microphone button on when speaking. This will ensure that you can be heard in the room and by those watching online. So going round the table this evening, I make some um, introductions. To my right is Councillor Markham, the Deputy uh, Vice-Chairman, Councillor Alan Kaufman, Councillor John Morgan, Councillor Debbie Radia, Councillor Paula Rodriguez and Councillor Steve Tuckwell. To my left, Democratic Service Officer Neil Fraser, uh, the Labour Lead, Councillor Jan Sweeting, Councillor Stuart Mavis, uh, Mr Tony Little, and we also have officers present here this evening. I will be making some changes to the agenda this evening. Uh, so as you are aware, we have pulled item uh, B from tonight's agenda. We will be taking item six first, followed by our review into littering and fly tipping, and then the agenda will resume as normal. With that said, I will begin with apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, all members are present. Thank you very much, and also a warm welcome to Councillor Morgan, who is new on the committee. <clears throat> are there any declarations of interest in matters coming before this meeting? Nope. I can confirm that all business tonight will be discussed in Part 1, which brings us to Item 4, to agree the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any questions or comments, Councillor Sweeten? <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as you know, in the minutes, um, it said that the committee would be provided with the detail of the SEN strategy and the new additional needs strategy. I think we've all received it, have we not? Um, but I was very surprised that the uh, strategy really is out of date totally. Um, all of the statistics relate to um, information audits of 2016, which is four years down the line. And so information on how many children have got SEN in particular schools is really not fit for purpose. So I would ask, as soon as the new strategy is up and running, that it does come to this committee, because it's such an important area of work that this committee is, is scrutinising. Thank you, Councillor Sweetin. I'm happy to agree that the committee is in agreement as well. Yes. yes okay. Thank you very much. Um, right. Sorry, are the minutes agreed? I assume they are agreed. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, okay, item six is the cabinet budget proposals for the next financial year. Uh, a warm welcome to Graham and Marcus. Marcus, I understand you'll be giving tonight's presentation to the committee. Good evening, everybody. My name is Marcus Bringshaw. I'm a finance manager. Um, and item six, uh, a paper that finalises the 2020-21 uh, budgets. Um, this is the second of two regular annual appearances from finance on budget setting process, uh, first having taken place last summer. Uh, although we attend policy and overview committees twice a year, the Council runs its budget cycle throughout the full year with the following financial year's budgets formally set next month uh, at February full Council. Um, our first appearance in summer, we presented to you the size of the challenges ahead with an update on the current budget gap and advised you that the work was underway to address the budget gap through the work being carried on within the groups on savings, contingencies and growth proposals. The report in the pack uh, presents, presented sets out the context of the budget recommendations, uh, including updates on funding and spend to recalculate the budget gap, details of specific proposals within the remit of this group that were presented in the consultation budget at December Cabinet recently. In this meeting, you'll get a chance to discuss these proposals uh, with your feedback being fed into the February Cabinet budget paper. So um, the report, the current projections 
uh, within uh, the report remain in line with those presented to you in the summer. Uh, funding updates from the Chancellor's spending review uh, in the late summer being largely in line with our original assumptions um, added a marginal 0.7 million net funding to the Council. Um, this is um, we gained approximately 4 million of additional social care grant income um, and that was offset by a loss of um, pool benefits from of 3.2 million as the uh, London business rates retention pool lost its pilot status. This reducing business rates retention from 75% to 50% of business rates retention growth. We're therefore currently forecasting a £27.7 million budget gap over three years 2020-21 to 2022-23. This is made up of uh, the 20 of £20 million pounds worth of savings yet to be identified, which see noted in Table 1 of the report, plus the £7.7 .7 million pounds worth of current savings proposals which are yet to be approved and, and, and delivered. The budget gap remains consistent with previous years and is consistent with other local authorities' financial positions. The budget gap reported in December 29 and here today assumes an inflationary uplift council tax of 1.8% per annum, based on 90% of the assumed uplift across London. Uh, in addition to this, for the first time the council is proposing to utilise the social care precept, um, adding a further 2% rise in the council tax as it becomes apparent this is a key element of the government's funding strategy uh, for social care in 2020-21. A total 3.8% increase in council tax adds uh, 43 pounds and 31 pence per annum to the average band D council tax liability or 83 pence per week. The 2020-2021 budget gap is the, is generally is, is the result of three areas of pressure. We have 30 million pounds worth of demand led and inflation population growth for continuing the same services. We have 6 million pounds worth of financing costs for the council's capital investment uh, plans. Uh, it should be noted that this increases um, finance costs increased at almost double to 12.4 million by 24-25. And then there's 8 million pounds worth of savings deferred from previous year in line with the council's savings strategy agreed in February 2019. So at that point, um, hopefully you've all had a chance to read the report. If you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them here or come back to you within. Uh, a short period of time if uh, I need to refer to colleagues. Thank you, Marcus. I invite questions and comments from members, if there are any. Councillor Vardia. Thank you, Chairman. I noticed on our report for this agenda item that the Council is increasing the charges placed on DIY and trade waste at the civic community site to bring it in line by 90% to the surrounding boroughs. And this committee, at the same time as hearing this tonight, is also considering fly tipping. I wonder what the impact of increasing the charges of DIY and builders' waste would have on fly tipping. Builders that frequently use a civic community site would quite quickly notice the increase in charges, and I appreciate that this perhaps isn't your decision, and I'm not necessarily expecting a response, but I, I do feel this is a point that should be noted if possible, Chairman. If you wish to comment, Marcus, you may do. If not, uh, the committee will note the comments raised by Council Vardu, and if officers wish to comment from the relevant um, area. I hear what you say. That's good enough. There's no supplementary, I assume, Council Vardu? Thank you. Councillor Sweetin? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the designated schools deficit, which is going to be nearing... 13, well, coming up to 14 million by the end of this financial year. Um, how is this going to be managed? Because in the past, it's mostly related to high needs um, deficit. And um, the council did ask schools forum um, this financial year to contribute. Is that likely to happen again? Um, because the deficit is, is going up and up. Correct. It is, it is an area of extreme risk. I'm wondering, Graham, would you want to 
make any comments on that being the lead from? Um, I, yeah, as Marcus says, it is an area of risk and an area of concern. Um, and looking at the 2021 budget, um, the, the only way that we can, can sort of close that gap in year is uh, to transfer money from schools block, which is what we've requested um, from the DfE to do. Thank you, Councillor Sweeten. Do you have a follow-up you wish to ask? My follow-up really will be with the fair funding formula that schools are being confronted with as well and with the reduction in numbers that some of our primaries are experiencing. There is real difficulty now in balancing the books in respect of some of our schools. Um, so I think we need as a council to recognise that and not ask too much of our schools to take into account this emerging problem with high needs funding. Thank you. Mr Little? Um, Could you use your microphone, please, Mr Little? Um, I, I would echo Councillor Sweeting's points on the transfer for, for high needs. Figures I've heard bandied about are quite substantial and would be at the expense of ordinary pupils in ordinary schools and redundancies and deficits in some cases. But I'd like to ask a question about the capital programme where it says that there's going to be... A, roughly £17 million reduction on expansion for secondary schools. Is that suggesting quite a big drop in projected numbers of pupils in the forthcoming future? Yes, I mean the um, secondary schools expansion and indeed the previous primary schools expansion programme have all been based on <coughs> um, projections um, um, on the from the um, the model that we use um, with the GLA, uh, which is all fed into our SCAP returns, uh, school capacity and um, program. Um, certainly, from over the last two years, we've noticed uh, a, a drop in in the forecast there, and particularly in this last refresh, there was a significant drop. Uh, in the uh, GLA models uh, assumptions and in, in their numbers. So uh, where we have thought that we might need seven FEs, for example, in the north of the borough, we're now forecasting we only need three forms of entry in the north of the borough. And within the s in the south of the borough, that's dropped from six FEs to one and a half. Therefore, we've uh, acted on that and taken out the planned investment for secondary expansion on, on schools. Thank you very much. Mr Little, before I allow you a follow-up, I believe Dan would like to also answer your questions. Thank you. And just to add to what Marcus has said, I mean, the, uh, and I've reported previously here to committee that the, uh, the forecast need for school places is a changing picture from year to year, and therefore we do an annual, an undertake and complete an annual refresh of what that need is, and there's lots of factors at play, <coughs> such as parental preference and decisions made about residential developments which speed up and slow down, so there's all sorts of factors that come into play, but, um, but Marcus is right, I mean the forecasts we were using two, three, four, five years ago um, are very different to those that we're using now, um, and so we have seen a reduction in, in the demand for secondary, but the important message from, from me and officers is that that demand is still much higher, but it's not as high as it was forecast to be. Um, and still there is a need for continued investment in school places and, um, and, and the peak that we're working to um, is for September 22 when we forecast to need an extra eight forms of entry um, and therefore there are plans in place for that. Um, but it's, and therefore the, 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 capital, the budget provision, the, the capital budget provision that's previously been made has obviously been adjusted to reflect that change. The other point I just wanted to quickly come in on, if you don't mind, Chair, is the, the point about the high needs uh, funding pressures, or more generally the school budget pressures, which have very much been driven by uh, pressure around um, uh, special needs school places and provision there. And there is, as links to the school expansion uh, proposals, there is uh, funding, grant funding available from government, but also additional funding that we're putting in, in the form of places within mainstream schools to try to ensure that there's local provision uh, rather than uh, provision that we have to make a long way away or select places a long way away from home um, or um, 
placements which are very costly. So there's a lot of work underway and I, I would suggest that we can perhaps have a fuller conversation at, at another committee date when the, the special needs strategy is prepared. Mr Little, do you wish to follow up? Um, thank the officers for their um, report. Um, I, I would like a repeat of the numbers you gave for the south of the borough. I didn't quite catch them. Oh, right. Um, I think we were originally forecast in 2018 that we needed six forms of entry in the south of the borough, and it's uh, dropped by to one and a half. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, Dan's covered off one of the points I was going to pick up, so thank, thanks for anticipating my, my point. Um, but, but I think looking at this, uh, we, we've looked at this for a couple of years now, and it's, it's all ama amazes me as to how the spinning plates have to be kept spinning and, and, and all importantly how frontline services have to, have to be maintained. So I think this committee should note that despite the, the financial pressures that we know the council is facing, um, the, the capital programme that, that's put out in front of us um, still provides adequate funds for, for a range of services. I mean, we're looking here at money set aside for road resurfacing, increase in youth provision, we've got a new leisure centre, we've got um, investment in sports clubs, uh, which is listed here. Um, we've got additional uh, resource put into antisocial behaviour and we've got additional resource which is also uh, aimed at the, at the Environment Bill and Animal Welfare gets a mention as well, which, uh, which, is, which is much needed as well. So I think all of that plus keeping fees and services within the 90% threshold um, of, of our neighbouring neighbouring boroughs, I think that needs to be noted uh, in, in the minutes. Uh, and, and everybody congratulated on, on presenting you know, a very, very difficult balancing act. So there's some, some difficult questions in here and some difficult challenges that have to be faced up to, but in the main, keeping frontline services at the forefront of, of, of it is, is to be congratulated. Thank you, Councillor Tuckwell. Um, I will note your comments, which I assume we'll officially adopt as a committee afterwards, but I, there are other members wishing to ask questions, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Councillor Mavis? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, there is good news. There's good news that the uh, investment in ASBET offices that the Labour Group's been calling for for many years uh, has been proposed, and I really look forward to that having an impact we'd like to see. Um, I am concerned about the financial pressures, which I think we all are, um, but particularly the concern around using continual use of um, capital receipts to fund um, some aspects of transformation, which is disguising cut to services or, or headcount pool around the bid team and I just want to make sure that we're maximising um, within transformation or cuts, however you want to view it, uh, fundraising and making sure that areas such as arts, um, leisure, uh, green spaces are really using um, the resource the council could have or should have um, with external grants and, and maximising the income that we receive um, because I know that many other London boroughs and elsewhere really benefit from external grants. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Markham wishing to ask a question. No. Easy enough. Um, I have Councillor Sweet now. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. <coughs> now, have you said at the beginning that we are here to monitor? It's our role to monitor our services. And are we actually monitoring the services after the transformations and the bids, etc. So have we, as of last year's transformations and balanced budget, actually stood back and monitored services? Because that is very important. I know that it's very important for the budget to be balanced, and I recognise all of the, the stretches that we as a council have actually had and, and the, the, the initiatives that we've had to put in place to balance the books. But have we actually monitored what's happening to our services? And I just pinpoint one service, and that's our SEND service. We've got the report that we're going to have an update on very shortly. But we have got schools saying, saying to us they are not, the council is not achieving the 20 week um, statutory requirement for education, health and care plan. In fact, when we look at new statistics, the newest statistics that we have on offer, it shows in 2018 that the council was just, just above 
of achieving that. We were the seventh uh, worst in London for achieving that. So can I please say, as a committee, yes, I accept that other things are happening. We are having capital programmes, etc., delivered. But we do need to step back and say each year, right, we had a cut in this area. Has that affected the delivery of that service? And if we, we do not know that, then we cannot, as a council, congratulate ourselves, I would suggest. So um, there, were, there were two cases. I had an elderly lady on Christmas Eve was told by this council that she owed £3,000 in council tax. It was an error. So she wept all over Christmas. Now the council still has not given her the information which says, no, she's actually got monies in the pot. They've taken too much out. So the services do need to be monitored, and, and I would say to us as a committee, please let us ask those questions after we have made the cuts for next year's budget. Councillor Markham. Thank you. It seems to me that uh, we are very properly briefed, regularly briefed by officers on a lot of these issues. I mean, every quarter we get housing. Um, and I feel very confident that, yes, officers know what's going on, and they share the downsides, they share the problems that we have. I think that the example that you just raised uh, was really should be dealt with by a member's inquiry. Our job, it seems to me, is not to go into the um, finite details. It's to take an overview to make sure that the policy is right. It's really down to others to ensure that the policy is being implemented properly. So I'm quite relaxed. I think we are well briefed, we are kept informed, and we do have lots of opportunities to challenge and to use your word to monitor what is going on. Thank you. I have no other members indicating they wish to speak, and I would like to make some progress with this. As the report lays out and the recommendations below, that the committee note the budget projections and comments accordingly, I will uh, request that the concerns raised by Council Sweeting and the Labour Party are noted in the minutes, as we usually do, but we do need to come to a consensus as a, as a, a committee to send our comments forward to be uh, considered by the Corporate Services Park and later the Cabinet. So uh, I will refer back to the comments made by Councillor Tuckwell earlier. Uh, as Chairman, I do believe those comments are relevant. I believe as a co uh, committee we should carry through with those comments to be included formally as a committee uh, and would propose those if they're adopted by this committee. Uh, I feel free to indicate now for your support. Are you yes, happy with that? Yes. Councillor, so did you indicate, Councillor Kaufman? Or are you just no. supporting? Okay, that's fine. So, to be, to be clear, so, so, sorry, Neil Fraser. So, so, with you, Chairman. So, just to be clear, wh what the Chairman is proposing is that the comments made by Councillor Tuckwell be adopted as the comments be taken forward for the future Cabinet member, sorry, Cabinet uh, report. If members would like to indicate whether they're happy for that to be supported, I'd be grateful. If there are concerns or, wish, or members wish that they cannot endorse those comments, please also make yourselves known. Thank you. So, Councillor Markham. Yeah, no, I think overall I'd like to congratulate officers in coming up with recommendations that meet the challenges, the financial challenges that we're faced with, even though there are one or two areas that we have great concerns about. Um, I think overall it's it's a good budget plan. Thank you very much. I thank the officers for their attendance this evening and for their presentations as usual. Uh, and we will now move on to our next item. You're free to leave okay. when you wish to do so. Thank you. <coughs> Our next item this evening is the review into tackling littering, littering and fly tipping. Uh, we don't have any presentations from officers. This is simply to review the recommendations that were distributed by Neil outside of this meeting, which I understand you will have copies of, if that's correct? Yes. Uh, we do have Cathy with us here this evening. Welcome to you, Cathy. I understand you'll just be listening in and commenting if relevant. Uh, so welcome to you as well. Are there any comments or questions from members? before? Councillor Markham. Yeah, I was quite taken with your uh, comments about costing and whether the additional cost will actually have an impact on the amount of rubbish which is flighted. 
and I think that may very well be something which we ought to look into. Councillor Sweetin. Well, I, I thank officers for the report, but I, I really don't think it goes far enough and is robust enough. Um, we had some very good um, uh, information from particularly David Braff, I think, of what he was doing in Hayes and the signing that they put up in Hayes that made a difference. And um, we've had in our report such things as glowing um, notices to, to shine in the dark, etc., etc. And I have a list of, of extras that I would like the committee to consider, yeah, if ahead. that's possible. First of all, um, the posters regarding fly tipping um, as an expensive menace are put up in every public space controlled by the council, including libraries, community facilities, etc. I think we're losing, I mean, I see on notice boards in my, my ward that it's my ugly face on it, plus my <laughs> colleagues, but, 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 but nothing about fly tipping. And I think we're missing a trick there. Um, and that the council liaises with housing associations so that the notice boards in their blocks of flats also have the notices from our, from our um, council. And that there is a rolling program of design of these posters. And I would bring our young people into that as well, our schools, because often parents take more notice of what their children do than they do of anything that we as a council do. And so we don't want them to be boring. We want them to be refreshed. Um, and then I mentioned about David Bruff and his poster, which we all liked very much. Um, and the £400 fine. Um, that areas with high fly tipping instances are provided with more visible enforcement and support, and we will know that by some auditing that will be done. Um, that I like the, the, the idea of glowing signs. I think that would be really good in some areas. Um, but additional CCTV cameras are not mentioned, and I know in my own ward, I often get the response back, the lampposts nearby are not of sufficient height. Then surely we as a council can build our own poles of sufficient height. So in those, those hard to reach areas that keep on having fly tipping, and I once, ha once had a diplodocus put in one of my areas, a huge, a huge um, a beast that was dumped um, but that is still the area that keeps on being tipped. Um, I also think that the council needs to sign up to the Keep Britain Tidy Network because they seem <coughs> to have... Well, I'm not quite certain that that is what we're saying there. Yeah. Keep Britain Tidy is Great British Spring Clean, mm -hmm. which is next sure. in March. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether we're tied up into their, their the organisation. Yeah. Um, and that the cost of fly tipping, I think we need to let our residents know that it's a huge cost to us. Yeah. And if it's being used to pick up their rubbish, it's not being used for all the other things that they want us to do. And so at every possibility, the big posters, that, you know, the very large posters, should have, you know, in the last year, Hillingdon Council has spent X in this area picking up your rubbish basically um, and then in the annual council tax letter maybe the, ca the leader of the council could make specific note of that so that everybody is fully aware of that um, I'm carrying on I'm sorry <laughs> um, and that the posters are made of more durable material um, because in the past they've just been put on lamp posts and have crinkled and I don't know have been um, and that banners, let's lose our banners over our high street to put information on fly tipping. Um, and that um, the posters on fly tipping are sent to all schools to be put up in prominent places. And that the council asks schools to take part in competitions to design posters, which also involve prizes, possibly, for the youngsters. Anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Sweeting. Very useful uh, comments and suggestions. Uh, if the committee is happy, I'll refer to Neil to look into those and see if it's possible to adopt any of them and come back with the findings, if that's yes, OK. Absolutely. Councillor Kaufman. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I 
agree with uh, Councillor Spreasing in many areas. I think if we're going to do something that we post to the rest sorry, of the Councillor, can you put your microphone on? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'll start again. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, and thank you, Councillor Sweeting. Um, but I think if we're going to use posters and all the rest of it, it needs to be a proper corporate across the borough um, event. And, you know, it needs to be continued. There's two types of fly tipping. One where a lorry tips a load of stuff. And the other is um, where they fill our waste bins up with, with domestic waste. And, and this is a real problem. Um, our, our waste um, department, I believe, is one of the best in London for collection of waste. <coughs> However, we've got to help them, and I think it's incumbent upon residents to do their bit as well. In other words, litter picking groups, etc., etc. And I come back again to your school's idea of designing a corporate, what shall I call it, um, promotional idea for the borough, you know, year on year. Um, one of the things that was interesting uh, to me was uh, item two, beautification and civic pride. In my ward, we currently planted hundreds of thousands of bulbs down the roads. And as they come up, it really does impress. It, it really does. And I think the more we can do this, the more we can beautify our areas, perhaps, just perhaps, people will take more responsibility for their fly, for their tipping. I mean, fly tipping is throwing pieces of paper or litter on the road or filling the, the bins up um, and I think the other thing here is this crime um, crime scene investigation tape I think this is a brilliant idea and I'd love to see this rolled out across our borough, I really would Pardon the pun. Yeah. Thank you Chairman <laughs> Councillor Markham Yeah I mean we've obviously got lots of little ideas you know, that each one of us but it's all covered in, yeah, the, in yeah. the recommendations. Um, one of the suggestions I might put forward is under section three about communication awareness. On the second page, it says the committee suggests that the council's current communication plans be amended. Perhaps we ought to insert the word robustly, plans be robustly amended to engage residents. So we're actually being a bit more proactive Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, I think this, this pretty much covers <coughs> the vast majority of, of what we want it to cover, notwithstanding the fine detail. I guess there's lots of mini projects that I'm sure officers will, will get on with, and I, I see it as this committee's objective is to sort of set the direction and the tone um, in terms of whilst picking lots of ideas out from the witness sessions we had. And one of the things that really struck me um, from um, the, the number of sessions we had was the, 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 the leaflet that we got from Hayes, which I think was three schools that collaborated together. And, you know, the, the imagery and the, the, the education, I think, is where it starts with that age. So I think without sort of being prescriptive about, you know, it's got to be this or got to be that, but I think the tone and the sort of the broad sense of you know what we want to try to achieve through the topic so if we're we're looking at sort of you know landlords and tenants beautification civic pride volunteers and young people and i think that pretty much covers the vast majority of it maybe a little bit more towards education and really sort of getting into people's mindsets <coughs> at a very young age but there's a few other things here and we're going to possibly talk about youth groups a bit later on but really engaging with some of the sort of settled and organized youth groups such as scouts brownies, guides and the like to get them on board um, community payback is covered off but I think maybe we can do more with the, with the community payback um, initiative um, and, and I think it's been said about a review of signage but I wouldn't want to be prescriptive about what that signage looks like uh, in terms of you know there's lots of different ideas and there might be different signage for different parts of the borough or different sort of locations but I certainly think there needs to be a review of it so I think it covers most things um, and I want to avoid being prescriptive because we're not going to come up with all the solutions around this table. So um, that's for me. Thank you, Councillor Tucker. Councillor Mavis. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just two points that I feel need more investigation. One is around, I don't feel there are any solutions here, and I know it's difficult to find solutions sometimes, around how we strategically approach 
flats where people are unable to store bulky items for a long time or smaller dwellings, those without gardens maybe, where they're not able to store mattresses, which, um, although the bulky waste collection, which is brilliant, um, does collect things, it, it takes some time or even a few days for some people when they've got no space. It is extremely difficult to, to live through. That was mentioned recently by a colleague of ours who struggled to, to know where to place a mattress. Um, uh, the other one was, is we learned a lot from uh, one of the original witnesses around the, the, the example that kind of Durham Council had made where they got the police together and a multiple agency approach which our council had adopted with the police to um, go and target those kind of vehicles that were trade waste and you know an initiative from another example that we that had become good practice is now being used across the whole of, uh, of England. I, I'd be keen to see more learning and more examples of good practice or at least a strategy around how officers continue to keep themselves um, up to date and then and, and visiting best practice when it comes to tackling these issues. If someone else has got the answer, let's go and borrow it, steal it, whatever it takes, <laughs> without, not fly tip it obviously, um, but let's, um, let's use as many ideas as possible. And, if it, and I know we invest a lot in our officers and, and they have a lot of knowledge, but the more opportunity they have to find best practice, the more that our residents will benefit. So I just think that's an area we could maybe think about. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'd like to thank officers for this uh, report. Um, however, I do feel that we're missing a few tricks here, um, a few areas that we're not considering. Uh, OK, yes, we've mentioned about fly tippers, and we always look at the big lorries <coughs> and the vans where they dump the rubbish on the side of the road and disappear. Um, but quite often, it's the shopkeepers. They'll put the rubbish out five minutes after the dust cart's gone. And so it's then out for 24 hours when the dust cart arrives again the next day. We don't seem to be educating our shopkeepers, our small businesses, to say, your waste collection is collected on this time of the day. If you put it out after that, we will fine you. Um, we don't seem to be acting on anything like that. And similarly, some of our residents have a habit every morning outside, drop their black bag by the door or onto the curb, walk to work or catch a tube or whatever, every day. And I'm sure that if you look at the, re the reports that I've sent in, phoning up every day in members' inquiries, fly tipping on XYZ roads, mm -hmm. exactly the same places, day after day <coughs> after day. So we've got to find a way of educating those residents to say, hey, you do realise, you put your bag out on the Tuesday in that area, you're going to get fined. Because our, our, and our area is on the Monday. So, you know, we've got to try and find ways of educating the residents. Children, I'm sorry, Councillor Sweetie, I, I can see where you're coming from, but I don't think it's the children's up, it's the problem. It is the older t teenagers, the 16, 17, 18 year olds, who have a habit of wherever they are, well, I'll just dump the rubbish there and, and walk on. So, you know, our, our uh, young children generally don't do it. They're normally pretty good. I think what Councillor Sweeting was also referring to was using the children as a, a good example, as a lever to, to guide parents to behave themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Kathy, was there any comments you wish to make based on what members have said so far? Uh, yeah, so on the first thing about uh, the concerns about the fly tipping prices going up, um, I can certainly provide uh, to Neil some evidence of our users at New Year's Green Lane site. That's where they go to. Um, we put up our trade prices last year. We're planning to do it again this year. So if there's any concerns about uh, any ramifications of that, um, I can certainly provide um, uh, stats on the uh, amount of trade customers that are being used so that you can see if the numbers have been affected, if that's going to be of use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, just to um, assure Councillor Morgan that um, Nathan Walsh and myself, so Nathan works obviously for the ASMIT team, um, we are utilising not only Nathan's team but also we are uh, educating our street cleansing teams to go through bags. Um, they, uh, we are given evidence bags from Nathan's teams. 
Uh, I've done training myself because you have to be quite prescriptive in how you actually complete the evidence bag so the prosecutions can then be made. Um, but we're trying to cast our net as wide as possible, not just looking at Nathan's team uh, for collecting evidence so that fines of £400 can be uh, collected, which is in itself an education, um, but also the people who are collecting those black bags. So it is the street cleansing teams that clean around our bins, empty our bins, shop fronts, um, those sorts of areas, and our fly tipping teams too. Thank you very much. Um, I don't believe there are any other members wishing to... Ah, oh, oh, Councillor Radio. Thank you, Chairman. A welcome pack for new residents to Hillingdon talking about how to dispose of waste properly is a great idea. But to me, it screams of paper, and I have this visceral hatred for paper. I think we, we just, all of us, need to be a bit more conscious, including myself, about reducing our use of paper. I believe that the council writes to people when they first move into the borough, asking them to sign up for their council tax. And I wonder, given that we do that anyway, if we could consider slipping in a leaflet into that letter about obligations about how to dispose of waste, rather than sending out more paper and more packs. The other recommendation, which I thought was very good, uh, was a way by which councillors and street champions could alert you to potential fly tippers whereby you would then write to them. I also wonder whether if residents are proactively contacting the council to say that so-and-so they suspect as a fly tipper, whether it could also be extended to that scenario because the residents, I'm a local councillor, but I feel that my residents are going to be far more aware of who the, or have suspicions about who the fly tippers are than me. So it's a great idea, but perhaps if we could also extend that to residents when a resident contacts the council to say that they're pretty sure it's X, Y, Z, if you could then proceed to sending them one of these general waste letters. I think that will really start send the shivers down, people. Thank you. Councillor Kaufman, yep. Yeah. Use your mic, please. Um, thank you. Um, I think when we had um, Keep Britain Tidy here and what they do, I think we definitely need to sign up to this because this is a sort of you know, a national thing, um, and it always was successful. And we've got to make people aware of what they're doing. And don't forget, in areas, or in our area, you've got people coming through that area throwing things out of cars. So it's not just our residents doing it. You know, so it's a general malaise of people. Well, someone else will pick it up. But I think a campaign like Keep Britain Tidy, or something we can tie into that within the borough. Is probably one of the best ways that we can get to people. You know, we, I don't know about you, but we get so many li um, pizza leaflets through the door and various other things, so they just get binned anyway. And when you get your council tax, you throw all the bits you don't want away and just keep the main form. <coughs> so it needs to be really in people's faces. Come on, let's really get the grips with this. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I Sorry, Cathy. Sorry, one more point. I just wanted to let you know that um, with regard to best practice, both myself and Nathan are very excited to go to a fly tipping seminar on the 4th of February in London so that we can have a look at to see uh, who is doing what. We can network with people. We can see what's working and why it's working and then bring that back to Hillingdon. So I just wanted to mention that too. Thank you very much. Um, to propose a way forward, uh, there were a lot of comments and suggestions mentioned this evening. I would suggest that Neil has made a note of those and I liaise with the Labour lead outside the meeting to finalise on those points to see which ones are valid and which ones aren't and we can work on a way forward from there. Is that agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much and thank you Cathy for your attendance. Agenda item 8 is our uh, update on adult learning within Hillingdon. Uh, welcome to you, Debbie. Uh, whenever you're wanting to, wishing to start your presentation, feel free to do so. Um, I may have misunderstood. I wasn't planning to give a call. Can't see you. Can't Sorry, I've pressed it on. I'll move it forward. No, no, no. These have no effect in this room. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I was just saying, I hadn't actually pl uh, prepared a presentation as such. Um, because I'd sent forward such a lot of paper, I was under the impression I'd be answering questions. That, but I'm happy to speak that, off the cuff if you'd that's like. That's absolutely fine. Some officers like to give presentations, but on the assumption that members have read the report, are there any questions to Debbie or comments that they wish to make? Councillor Markham. Thank you. Um, I've got two, really, Cathy. One is I'm interested about the budget, how much money uh, is spent on adult learning in the borough, the numbers of people actually taking advantage of this service. That's my main thing. But I noticed that on page 24 you highlighted a, a few wards. I think it would be helpful to know how many residents there are perhaps per ward uh, in order that gives us a better idea. Because what I'm particularly keen on is value for money. And I'd just like to know how much we're spending, how many people, the cost per person, and whether we all feel that it is actually good value for money. Because my understanding, well, you tell me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I did receive a couple of questions through this afternoon. Um, the, in terms of the, the budget itself in going out, we, it varies between about 20,000 and 40,000 that comes from the council towards adult learning. Everything else is externally funded through, as of this year, this academic year, the GLA for Londoners, because the money, the funding has been devolved, and um, the Education and Skills Funding Agency that funds schools and, and everywhere else for anybody that's outside London. Uh, so the, by far the bulk of our funding comes from those two sources. Well, we've got, this current year, we've got 1.6 million, pretty much, coming from the GLS, GLA and the SFA. Uh, we also get um, an allocation, I think this year it's about 50,000, for adult learning loans, which are for people who want to do the equivalent of A-levels. But actually... We never, ever use up our allocation because it's based on the assumption that anybody doing one of those courses wants to take a loan out to pay for it, and many people don't want to. So if I give you an idea that, that last year we spent, we, we actually drew down about £6,000 of that. So um, I, that's, just allocate, that's just including that. And of that, there's about 20000 that is is transferred across from the early years team in the local authority and for that we train all of the local authorities childminders so they will come in for an information session to the council um, and to us and then they will come through the training courses with us and then they go back and they hopefully they want to build up their business they set up their business so they have to be offset registered and after that point they can start their business and we've, re we've recently set up um, a, a professional development online tool that we're offering free to those childminders who have now got their businesses going because, because they're taking care of children all day, they don't really want to come out to additional training in the evening and so that enables them to access some small training courses, um, keep themselves up to date without additional expense. So that, that's kind of our our basic funding for this year. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, pursue ex for other external funding. So, for instance, at the moment we're finishing a project called Talk English, which has brought in just over 42,000, which is aimed at working with women with very poor English skills, and we train volunteers to, not to deliver those classes out in the community. So that's another 42,000 we'll find out whether the government are going to refund it. It comes from MHC, NCH, MHCLG. Um, we'll find out soon whether they're going to refund again for next year. Um, we have currently another fund of £470,000 that's coming in over this financial year and next financial year that's coming from the City of London Corporation, which is, is about... Um, a variety of things, but all, all of which will benefit our residents. So, so actually, if you add all those up, um, you're looking at just under 1.9 million. 
just under, something like that. Next year, again, we've got other things going through. If we get those, we'll be tipping over the two million point. But the problem is, not all of it is sustainable. So the two year 470,000 will end, and then we need to be finding other sources of funding. So we're always looking for other funding. In terms of the wards, um, I have got a breakdown. It's probably... Sorry, in terms of the numbers, your microphone. the numbers in the wards, yes. No, no, no. In terms of the total numbers of residents taking advantage, the Ofsted paper suggests it was 1,458 people were actually attending adult learning courses. Yes. Is that right? No, it, it, it was at the time. They were looking at the number of people on course in December. So, so what is the if we look now? at well, actually, if we look at last year, where we've got the full academic year. We had 2,236 individual residents from Hillingdon. We had nearer 3,000 in total because some of our residents don't, some of our learners don't come from Hillingdon. They come from other parts of London or out into Bucks and the neighbouring areas. And if you stay, stay with Hillingdon residents, we had those 2,236 created 5,170 enrolments because very often learners, uh, residents will do more than one course. I'm trying to get a cost per head. I'm trying to get a cost per head. Can you help me here? Uh, I can go away and play with the figures and try to get your cost per head. Well, I mean, the simple one is the budget is about 2 million quid. We've got, you're saying, 2,000 people individual residents in, taking advantage of the course. In Hillingdon, Hillingdon residents, yeah, not yeah, residents yeah. in well, total. I mean, roughly, it's about twelve hundred, thirteen hundred pounds per person per year. Okay. But based on the information, so I just wanted to know whether thirteen hundred pounds per person per year is good value for money. Perhaps we should leave Debbie to look at outside the meeting and get the actual figures first yeah. if you wish to do so. Um, I'm going to move on because there's other members who should ask questions. Councillor Sweeting? <coughs> well, can I say I think it's excellent value for money because it's reaching particularly women that um, are um, rocking up to these, these various activities and they wouldn't be sort of participating at all without having... Um, um, uh, lecturers helping them with their language and all the other skills. Um, I mean, you can see from the, the audit of the wards that use the service the most um, where the need is, is, is very great. And, and can, I, can I just say that I am very pleased that this report has come to this committee because we haven't seen this information before and, and we very much welcome it. I have a very good friend that, that works for your, for your team, one of your teams, and I know she works extremely hard mm -hmm. for her residents. Um, my question, though, <laughs> is that the local authority contribution is actually 70k. That's on page 28, fourth paragraph, of which only about 40k is being utilised. Um, do we know why the whole fund is not being used? I keep going to press that and forget <laughs> um, It's because <coughs> the... What we try to do, what we try very, very hard to do is to break even. We try to take as little as possible. So depending on all kinds of, of, of movable, movable fees, whether we've got additional funding or what that funding is aimed at doing or who's coming to the courses or all sorts of things, some years we don't need to take as much as other years. So we try to bring that down as much as we possibly can. So in a perfect world I'd be taking that down to zero but it, it just depends year on year we, we don't try to use the allocation if you like we've got we try to use as little as possible of it Do you have a follow up Councillor yeah, Sweeting? Yeah. Um, because we have got um, significant rises in our population in certain areas um, are we looking at new venues? I know that my friend has been criticising a particular venue because of the lack of parking. Um, so are we looking at venues, particularly in the south of the borough, where you know, parking and, and the ways of getting there is not such an issue? We, we are constantly out working with partners. So in terms of our main centres, we aren't looking at different venues um, 
because we've got a particular desire to move to another venue. We're quite well placed. What we do all the time is look for other community partners. So quite apart from the work we do in, for instance, Brookfield or, or wherever, we're also out working with community groups, often, I mean, sometimes one-man bands, you know, sometimes very small, and we're doing a lot of work out with those partners so that it's local to the target groups we're trying to reach. Um, so, for instance, we've worked in the Amadea Mosque and we've worked in oh, all kinds of places so that we go to the residents as well as them coming into our centres. The biggest issue with parking with us is definitely Brookfield. There is no question about it. Um, but we do everything we can to try to allow people to park. And actually, the venue itself is fantastic. It's really it's a fantastic resource. So it's just the price we pay for being in London, I think, to be honest. Thank you. Councillor Maris? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, it's good to hear um, that the money from the Mayor really being invested into Hidden Residents and that we're benefiting from that. I, I looked at the programme for what was offered and, I, and I'm, I'm wondering how do you, how does your, uh, within your strategic approach, how do you um, assess need across the borough and, and look for those areas where there's a gap? I think I noticed a little bit that there is, uh, I would expect in certain areas there'd be more e-sold than others, um, et cetera, et cetera, but also, um, I was just surprised at the lack of kind of creative workshops such as photography, et cetera, in the south of the borough. Mm -hmm. They were very much more focused in the north. But I know that might be around kind of where the market is for that course. Mm -hmm. But how do you ensure that those um, those skills are shared across the borough and, and how, do you, what, how do you go about your needs process in your strategic aims? Well, we, the first thing we do is review what's happened the year before. So we look at, at which courses have filled. We look at the ones that we planned that didn't run. Um, we also, of course, look at the borough data so that we, we try to use all the intelligence. We also use feedback from the, the learners and feedback from partners out in the community. The other thing to consider is that there's probably another 25, 30% of the provision we run. I think that's the phone rather than the fire alarm, <laughs> so we're okay. <laughs> Pro probably another 25, 30% of the provision we, that we run is not in the brochure. So it's off, off brochure so that we can meet with a particular school or a particular children's centre or a particular partner and negotiate with them what they identify as their key needs. So we kind of put the, the, the courses, for instance, the arts courses that we put in the brochure tend to be most of the arts courses we run. We have tried very hard to do things like we do a lot of languages. We've tried to run community languages for many years. We just can't get the take up for various courses in different parts of the borough. There's simply just different needs in different parts of the borough. So we, pr we take those out with the partnership work and we'll sort of say, oh, would you like to do a, an art class or something in the south of the borough? So we take one to a particular partnership and see how that works but we negotiate all the partnership provision and we, we put together agreements based on what that particular, often voluntary group, feels is the need for their clients. So there's a mixture of, in terms of planning, we look at the strategic drivers, obviously the local authority, the GLA and so on. We also then look at the, the feedback we've had and the experience we've had of the previous year, but but sometimes longer than that, courses and, and what has run, where is the demand, what are we seeing? And then we're very, very responsive. So all year long we're out, our managers are out making those connections, trying the provision, and then we see, did it run? Should we run it differently? Was it a huge success? Do we need an extra class? Do we need to try it a different way? Do we not try that anymore? And we really feel our way as much as possible because every partner has a very different approach. So somebody like working with somebody like Hillings and Carers or Mind or a Stroke Association or a dementia group would be completely different from working with a Somali women's group or so we we very much tailor the provision to the partners. Does that answer your question? Do you wish to follow up, Councillor Thank you. That is extremely helpful. Uh, I really commend you in that work and also the 
continued way you, you are disengaging with the most deprived areas of our community and really reaching out, that is I, I just yeah, that is fantastic. Um, I suppose I was looking at the, the volunteer model really. So in Hillington we don't really have a, a volunteer centre anymore of, of magnitude. Volunteering is something that we rely on but don't always promote. But clearly there's some good practice from the way you're doing languages and other bits. Um, is there ways in which you could share some of that learning either with the voluntary sector or with, within the council itself so that we can um, a, get a, a real understanding of, of the best way to manage volunteers and keep that enthusiasm going, but also across different service areas, um, look at how you, you use volunteers to engage the hardest to reach in our society. Mm. Yes, I'd be happy to, happy to do that. There is some of that going on informally anyway, because I work with other council officers, of course. But yes, of course. Mr Little. Thank you. Um, I welcome the report. It, it is a novelty for us, I think, to have, have one on, on this area. So you have to excuse our ignorance of, of some of the things that you're, you're doing. I had two questions, if I may. One is about your ambitions. It, it struck me that um, 2,200 Hillingdon residents is, is kind of only two-thirds of 1%. You know, what are, what are your ambitions? How, what are you trying to do to expand the, the use of the service? And my second question is, do you work with other groups like the U3A and the WEA, who, who also obviously have educational purposes um, in the borough for um, more mature people? Okay, so taking it backwards, we don't work directly with the UEA and the WEA, but we do, um, strategically, I mean, but we do do small individual, again, sort of partnership agreements with them. So, for instance, we've worked, uh, I think it was last year, we worked with the um, U3A around horticulture courses. Um, they've got there was a, a fairly strong interest in that, so we worked we, we worked with them in partnership to provide horticulture courses for that, some of those those uh, members, um, which we did at the RAGC. Um, and so again, it's it's quite sort of individualised. Strategically, no, we don't have a formal partnership with either of those groups. But on a more informal basis, based on the partnerships, if there's a demand, then we will go and see what we can do. Um, what I would say, though, is that the WEA do very similar work to us in many ways, um, and so we're both trying to to reach uh, people that struggle, for instance, with their English and maths and so on. Um, and and so it's a bit. There are so many partners we want to work with. If I'm perfectly honest, it's not really at the top of my list, and I don't think we are with them because we've already got a similar approach, a similar brief, we're all trying to do the same thing. So if I'm at a, a networking event, I'll always catch up with the people that are there. But in terms of day-to-day -day working in partnership, we don't particularly do that at the moment because we're trying to do the same things anyway. Um, in terms of expansion, actually, we are struggling to meet demand. Um, nationally, numbers of adults engaging in learning has been declining for about 10 years. In Hillingdon, particularly uh, around English, maths, ESOL, well-being, digital skills, the numbers are increasing, the demand is increasing. Childcare has increased by over 200% in the last two years. Um, our, our aim is, it's about reaching people, and that's why we do the outreach, but it, it's sort of bigger than that, it's about helping the people that we reach move through the, the stages of their education. So a lot of the time we're working with low-skilled, low-waged groups or the unemployed, and what we want to do is not just engage them and, and tick a box. We want to engage them and then help them move into the next level and the next level and the next level. And the person that we consider a huge success is somebody who came in and joined us with low skills, very often that is accompanied by very low confidence and low self-esteem um, and also narrow, um, a narrow perspective on what they can achieve. 
and help that person move through so that by the end they're, they are saying, I can be a childminder or I can work in a particular field, I can be a florist or I can work in health and social care or, you know, so very often learners are with us for five years working their way through those skills levels and out into employment at the end or, or indeed volunteering or being able to engage with the community and being able to speak to their child's teacher, see a GP independently, shop independently, just function. Um, as I say, we do target women in particular because they're the most likely to be struggling with those issues. Um, but obviously we, we welcome men as well. Um, but that is very often the case. If you can reach a woman and who hasn't got that background, sometimes if it's an Esau lady, sometimes in their own language, they're not liter literate, and help them begin to build that confidence, their children's education can, can improve their own and their children's engagement with the community can improve. So it's not always work, but that's what we try to do. So although we do want to encourage numbers, that's not the be-all and end-all. It's, it's a, a bigger picture than that. Thank you. Uh, do you have a brief follow-up, Mr Little? I, I had one that wasn't brief. But oh. I'll, 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 I'll I have pass. other members wishing to speak. We do have a, a very big item after this as well, so if we can keep our questions and answers to the point, uh, that would be appreciated. But if you wish to ask one afterwards, if I go around the table first, you're free to do so. Um, Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, Debbie, I'd just like to sort of thank you for your report. Thank you also for answering the questions with such enthusiasm. And I'm sure that your department benefits from someone like you with enthusiasm, with forward looking um, attention to detail. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, again, thank you for the report. Nice to see you again. Um, you. For me, it's, it, it's kind of been touched on, but in terms of feedback from the learners, what was the process to obtain that? Because obviously it's important to learn from their experience and also ensure they get the best possible experience for themselves and also for future learners. So mm -hmm. I'm just interested to know as in how we get sort of feedback from the learners. A lot of the time it's through surveys. Um, we also, in fact, it was really good that Ofsted had a fantastic turnout. They were really impressed when, when they put their own survey out. Um, we also have a learner council that's elected from the learners. So each group of learners chooses a course representative. Those court representatives can stand uh, as part of the learner council and they're elected to that role. So they give us feedback directly, both through the course rep role, but also in terms of being a learner counsellor. So, for instance, one of the activities they do is a secret shopper activity, which they do once or twice a year. Um, we've got two members of staff that know when that's happening. I don't know. I don't get involved in it. They just feedback, and so far they've been really good. Uh, we get a lot of feedback at things like open days when we're recruiting, and we scour <coughs> over it. Um, but there's more to do. I mean, I'm not happy with that at the moment. There's still more to do, but it's very important. And of course, you know, uh, you will always hear things like going back to your point about the parking. You know, if there's something that people aren't happy about, you always hear about it. You don't always hear about the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, we do get feedback, and we we take it very seriously. But we do that in lots of ways. Okay. No. Thank you. Yep, Councillor Bardia. Adult education has such a transformative life, a tr transformative effect on the lives mm -hmm. of people. Under 20% of your learners are coming from deprived backgrounds, mm -hmm. and you're obviously doing a very great job. But I wonder what strategies you have for the future to try and increase the percentage of your learners that are coming from the deprived backgrounds. Well, actually, we've put one of the bids we're waiting to find out if we've got is something called an innovation fund that's coming through from the GLA. And if we're successful, we'll know in February, and it could be another 150,000, which we're hoping for. And the the project we've suggested is that we want to take those people in outreach and try to build bridges between the outreach centres that they're going to and actually moving into qualifications and moving into coming into our centres because that's one of the issues that every adult learning provider has and we're no exception. 
So we've, we're coming up with different strategies to enable us to do that. If we can do that, they bring friends. Yeah. That's how it works. Adults don't tend to... If, if, if a youngster is going to college or university, they will go straight online. Adults tend to ask their friend or their sister or their husband or their wife. Or, so if, if we can get those people more engaged... What we don't want to do, and we do have some of it happening, is that somebody comes in and they do their art program or their language or whatever it is they've done, their maths, in an outreach provision. They say, thanks very much, and they go. That's a waste. So we're trying to build those bridges, and we've just asked, as I say, hopefully if we get that, that will really enable us to do that. But we are confined by our funding, and there's only so much we can do. So. Do you wish to have a... Okay. Councillor Markham? A uh, comment and a question. Um, the comment is, I think the 20 to 40 grand a year that Hillington residents pay is incredibly good value for money. <laughs> and, and equally, I think the service that you and your colleagues are providing is top notch. Yeah, many congrats. Thank and you. I, mean, I speak for all of us here. Please <coughs> pass down the line our uh, thanks to everybody who is involved in adult learning for what they do. Yeah. My question is, do you publish an annual summary of what you're doing. Yes. Well, would you be good enough to make sure that councillors, all councillors, get a copy of it? Because, Absolutely. as you probably gathered, there's a lack of knowledge uh, as to what the hell you're doing. And I think what you're doing is terrific, and we all ought to know about it. Thank, Thank you. you. We've got the um, self-assessment report from last year, or last academic year, um, which was finished in December. So I'm happy to send that across. I can send that out through. <coughs> Neil. Thank you. Yep, we can note that. Councillor Sweeting, you wish to comment? Um, just that we realise that your um, service strategic plan is going to be updated. When that actually happens, can that please come back to this committee? Because I think we want this issue to be on our work programme because we need to know what's happening out there um, because we know it's very, very important to many of our residents. And thank you for the report. Mm. Thank you. Mr. Little, I believe you're the only one left to finish, uh, so if you wish to do so, you. can you use your microphone, please? Thank you. What are the <coughs> what are the biggest obstacles remaining to you? Funding, always funding, um, and I think if. If some of the funding that we've applied for comes through, we've, we've, um, we've just received our funding for next year, which is, is about 1.5 million. This is our core funding, the bottom line that we can employ staff on. If that um, appeal that we've just put in for an additional 150,000 is successful, then we can employ more staff because, as you mentioned earlier, our staff, we've got a fantastic team. They're all there because they're passionate. And if we can get more staff in place, some, some of the, for instance, we're trying to build up the careers advice that we give our residents. We're trying to, we're using the SIP funding that we've got to put some things in place that we can put online so that it can help everybody. Um, and to build up the team to be able to do that, to sustain it beyond that two-year provision would be fantastic. So it's those sorts of things, I think. It, it's it's funding and it's, and it's then staffing it. And I think the other thing is people being aware of what we do. Uh, that would be the other biggest barrier, that so often people are aware of a university because they've been there. Everybody knows about school because they've been there. People are familiar with colleges, particularly with Uxbridge next door, that's got such a big high profile. But I think one of the other barriers we face is that people often don't know that we're even around. And so... We're working with corporate comms and, you know, we've got great, great support from other officers, but that would be the other barrier, just to raise awareness of what we do. Do you wish to follow up? Okay. Debbie, thank you very much for your attendance this evening and your answers. Thank you. You can leave when you uh, wish to do so. <coughs> okay. Um, item nine is our information item on youth services. Good evening to you, Paul. Uh, whenever you wish to do so, please give your presentation to the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
So what I was asked to do is, um, is, is provide um, the committee a, um, an update um, on the Council's provision for young people. Um, obviously what I've done is, is, is pull together a, a report which is, um, I think when some people talk about uh, provision for young people, they tend to just think about young people centres. But what I've actually done here is I've sort of um, hopefully illustrated the breadth and, uh, and, and well, width of, of uh, the provision that we actually as a council support, the opportunities that we provide for our young people uh, right across the borough. Um, so obviously I, I hope I've provided quite a lot of detail and um, obviously uh, I'm here to um, help with any um, questions and uh, inquiries really. <coughs> very brief. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I invite questions from members. Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Paul, for the, the report. Um, I'm just looking through Appendix 2, and I've noticed, noted that you know, we're saying that we've got 71 groups within the, the bar. <coughs> However, I can't see anything mentioned in Northwood or Northwood Hills. Are we saying that we don't actually have any... <laughs> Scout groups, bat brownies, guides, rainbows or cubs in Northwood or Northwood Hills? I need to double, double check that. The issue that we have with the Young People Centre at <coughs> Northwood is that currently it's uh, not available because we've got some um, building works that we need to address <coughs> on that particular site. Uh, quite severe building works, so it's not a case we can just open it up and let young people use part of it. It's a large proportion of the building which uh, is causing us concern with, um, with damp that uh, seems to be um, getting into the building. So that's presented some challenges. Our uh, First Citizens team are obviously working up a, a program to get that work rectified. Um, so we're just waiting for a detailed program. So once that's, uh, that issue is sorted, then obviously the provision that we provide um, will certainly uh, be increased. And I'll, I'll double check the, the scout groups because I thought we were pretty, um, pretty up to speed on those. So I'll, I'll double check it anyway. Do you have a follow up? Yep. Yeah, just, just to confirm, there are scout groups in Northwood. Yeah. Um, I actually opened their scout hut right. um, <laughs> in September. So, yes. There's yeah. definitely scout groups There's and scout brownies groups, yeah. and guides and everything. Yeah, else I, said, I said I'll double, double check that. So. Councillor Markham. Thank you. Could we come back to money, uh, if we may? Um, I'm just interested to know what the total budget is for youth services and the number of users there are aged between 8 and 19. Well, as the report sort of describes, that the, the offer is, is quite large. But to try and answer your question, if I look at the universal youth services, um, um, so it's really the, the young people's centres, so the budget is um, for this year £546,000 um, um, and uh, we've welcomed certainly in this last year just shy of 32,000 young people have been members so obviously their visits are more than that but our membership <coughs> if you like is just shy of 32,000 Do you have a follow up? No. No? Okay. Councillor Mavers Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, a, an interesting report on, on the youth offer. Uh, it doesn't, for me, answer the questions on the youth service. Um, I'm, um, I, I am interested, firstly, in uh, some continued explanation on the rationale between dividing the targeted youth services into early intervention and prevention. And I am disappointed if we can note that, although it's not under this POC, that there isn't someone from that service to talk about the collaboration between the two uh, departments. Um, and the universal offer, which sits under resident services. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, uh, I, I, have to, I am a trained youth and community worker. Um, I spent many years working in local societies in our areas doing that role. And youth work is an informal education. It, it's an opportunity to bring young people, not just through positive activity, but into um, the chance for them to thrive and grow and to avoid harm. And, and your objectives do talk about yeah. um, staying safe and, and a number of measures. I think in a, in a day when we are seeing increasing amounts of young people um, isolated, uh, making um, difficult choices about whether they should associate with people that are 
uh, bad influence, and, and that's been there through the years, but to mm -hmm. the point where it's getting violent and the belonging is more important than, than alternatives where we see um, violent crime on the rise and hate crimes on the rise uh, amongst young people, and young people as victims, yeah. um, and, and we know that very much in this building, sadly, exactly, yeah. um, that, that to not have the two services under the same roof in a preventative measure, um, and although um, sport and leisure and sport development and stuff does have a preventive access, uh, aspect, to not have them very closely aligned as part of a children's services strategy to enable young people to be de-escalated for social care and then um, uh, or, or early um, identification within social care, it, it concerns me deeply. And when, when I've seen local authorities across England, uh, bearing in mind that this service would have had, it was £4 million in 2012 was the budget, and I don't know how much of that's been taken out for targeted, but we're now down to um, just over 500,000. I think two years ago it was 700,000 spent on the service. We've seen a continual cut on this service year on year as austerity has taken hold. And I'm deeply concerned that we're not using our youth service um, as, as an opportunity uh, to, to be kind of lined up within the children's services strategy. I recognise that it's still doing great preventive work within residence services, but could you just explain a little bit more of, uh, of the impact to the service kind of pre that move and, uh, and and now, and, and actually how effective those lines up between the two departments are? Well, between targeted and, and universal. So obviously the decision was, was made a number of years ago to, to make that, that split, and obviously the, the universal side and the universal team um, came across to myself, um, and obviously the, uh, the targeted side um, stayed um, with, with, uh, with the other team. Um, you know, Obviously, my lead manager, uh, Detty Quirk, she works quite closely with her counterparts on Targeted. Um, Fountains Mill um, in Uxbridge is probably uh, the centre that um, is probably used the most by both groups, but that's not just to say that that's the only site. So there is, um, there is crossover on, on provision. Um, on the Fiesta programme as well, um, we again uh, provide uh, spaces on the Fiesta program, which is a universal, or a universal run program. So again, we provide places for um, placements for young people from the targeted team as well. So there's those sorts of synergies, but um, you know, obviously, decision was made, um, you know, rightly or wrongly at the time to sort of split the services. Um, and whilst they're they, they're working with young people, they're working with young people in slightly different ways. But where there are synergies, we do sort of come together. Do you have a follow-up, Councilman? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I would, I'd be really interested in more information around kind of how much is de-escalated from social services into the universal offer, um, and, and information around um, uh, just just the best practice of working in different departments. Uh, my question kind of falls to: um, So Fiesta is is a is a fantastic summer youth offer. Yeah. Uh, works with a number of different sports. Um, associations and clubs and different groups. Uh, Fountains Mill runs a lot of kind of drop-in services as part of the targeted provision. Um, I was surprised at the lack of um, uh, kind of universal offer in the evenings to, uh, to young people. I know there are a limited number of centres and, and one is um, established by flooding and West Australia yeah. had its, its moments of fire, etc. I understand yeah. it's really <coughs> difficult. Um, and that there's no... Um, youth provision being run by the youth service in other venues, community centres, etc., directly. Uh, and just to, to kind of, if you look at the map, there's a big gap in the middle of Hillingdon in some quiet um, areas where there's quite abundant groups of population um, between kind of Harlington and Charville, you know, West Straiton and Uxbridge. It's, there's, there's a, a big gap. And I know that in the bus may go out, for example, it goes to, I think, usually Rec and different places because yeah. it goes out from West Straiton most of the time. Um, but to not have a regular presence in, in other community centres uh, and to be meeting the need, uh, incentive-based or outreach-based or detached-based or whichever method of youth work you want to use, what strategy or plan is there to make sure that there's a youth offer directly delivered by the youth service across the whole of the borough where the youth population is, rather than just in centre-based or bus-based work, which targets specific areas depending on certain ancestral behaviour, etc.? Yeah, <coughs> I think you know one of the things that um, you know has been explored is obviously if you look at Harefield, uh, the the, the lack of provision in Harefield. But then what we're finding <coughs> is that um, though we provide opportunity, uh, with, you know, if you're looking at the, the young people centres primarily, 
is that in some instances they're not that attractive to young people for whatever reason um, you know that the, they, they once were things have changed and it's trying to work out why that, that, that why there is that change we are finding just to, to sort of pick up on, on your point that though there may not be um, direct provision in, in a particular area that doesn't stop young people from then traveling to where we do have provision so we know, you know, I picked up, um, you know, the uh, example of Harefield. We know that people from Harefield are attending sessions at Fountains Mill. So there is that opportunity, and obviously with <coughs> travel a lot uh, easier for young people, um, you know, they're, they're sort of taking their advantages. So, you know, at the moment there's no, um, you know, desire, if you like, to add any additional centres to our portfolio. I think we have challenges um, with uh, attracting um, youth workers, um, so that's always a challenge. We find that there's uh, quite a high level of churn in, in, in staff that uh, stay with us um, and then move on. Some because it's, uh, it's a second job um, and you know, then they, they find something else. Some it's because they're, you know, they do it for a while and then move on to something else. So we're finding keeping um, staff retention for youth workers a bit of a challenge at the moment. We know we're doing some further recruitment, we've just done some further recruitment on uh, youth leads this week um, and we're looking at now uh, looking at uh, further recruitment for youth workers um, uh, adverts going out next week. So we have these sorts of challenges but to answer your question is that uh, you know, we have no uh, desire at the moment to uh, adds to the number of youth centres. Um, what we're looking at is trying to maximise um, opportunity within the centres that we have <coughs> and obviously, you know, trying to sort of encourage people to use some of the, uh, the centres via, you know, public transport and the like. Thank you, Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, good. <coughs> so, so thank you for that. Um, <coughs> Youth groups, uniformed youth groups, he's mentioned a couple of times um, in here. So how are we looking to lever the expertise that these groups have to support the, the youth offering across the borough? We don't sort of lever it. I think what we do is encourage it. You know, so from a council, we, we try to, um, you know, um, provide opportunity again. So... You know, we're aware that they have their challenges, so it might be that, um, you know, they, it tends to be around financial um, concerns, so it might be that they need a new minibus, and then the council will then help support, um, you know, by providing a new minibus. It might be because their building is, is old and tired and, uh, you know, not of, uh, of great shape, and the council will then help them with a new building. So, you know, they're very much sort of running their own affairs, um, but we obviously... Uh, value the work that they're doing, we encourage the work we, that they're doing and wherever possible we, we support the work that they're doing through financial grants, financial opportunities to ensure that you know, the lack of funds doesn't mean that they fold, it means that they can continue um, and, and continue to grow. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Tuckwell? Yeah, uh, a slightly different subject. Is in the Appendix 1 it's referenced the Youth Council um, and I was just, it talks here about, um, you know, how the Youth Council is, uh, how it's organised. I was just wondering whether or not, um, in terms of the overall offering or some of the projects or some of the services, whether or not the Youth Council has, has for want of a better expression, been consulted or have some involvement so that what we are offering has actually got some sort of buy-in from, from, from young people. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the Youth Council is, is is, is, is one voice but I think you know the, the, the point you pick up is that you know as adults you know and sort of picking up the, the, the concerns that we have that you know we want our uh, young people centres to be attractive and, and, and places that people want to go so the team when they're actually meeting young people is that they're actively trying to find out you know what young people want so we can actually provide it you know, it's no point in um, us providing Xboxes when their preference is PS4s. So, you know, we value their voice, we listen to their voice, and we act upon their voice. So, you know, we want the, the, the sites to be, you know, attractive. 
We know that a lot of young people at the moment, if you go to McDonald's, they're all sitting in there loitering in there. Now, why are they sitting in there and not coming to our sites? You know, we can provide free Wi-Fi. We can provide uh, access to the computers. We've got, as I said, lots of different opportunities. And, and you know, we want to make our sites attractive. But it's trying to get their, the young people to, to uh, you know, try us. And, and that we are, shall we say, cool to go to. Because at the moment, there's a number of young people that don't think it's cool to go to a young people centre. So we're trying to sort of break that down. So our, our youth workers do spend quite a lot of time in schools, recruiting, if you like, saying this is what we have on offer. This is our Duke of Edinburgh uh, programme that we have on offer as well. This is what's at the sites. You know, come down, we've got free Wi-Fi, we've got all the access to all these sorts of things. Come down and spend time with us rather than, you know, getting chased out of McDonald's or wherever they are. So it's, it's those sorts of things that we're actively trying. But... Yeah, we certainly value the voice of our young people, and that's a voice that we're very keen to listen to um, now and for the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before I move on to Councillor Kaufman, I would just like to ask a question of my own following Councillor Tuckwell's comments on uniform groups. Um, I won't make it a ward matter, but I do have a number of scouts and cubs in my own ward, uh, and speaking to them, they have waiting lists for uh, young people to join their groups and the main issue around that is actually the recruitment of leadership and adults in those groups. Is there anything in our existing budgets as a council that we could do to assist those groups by offering to advertise recruitment availability in Hilland and people for example uh, things like that? Certainly you know, I've, you know I think if um, you know if we're made aware of these sorts of challenges then we can you know do what we can to respond to those challenges you know, um, we can help by, you know, putting recruitment posters up in our libraries, for instance. Mm. We can put, uh, as you said, something maybe in Hillens and People that we do a bit of an article about uniform groups, the value of uniform groups, um, you know, obviously, you know, trying to maybe attract more children, but also try to get some adult uh, assistance as well. Mm. Um, you know, and again, I think <coughs> it's probably exploring what the barriers are there. I expect it's just, you know, people saying, well, I haven't got the time and all the mm. rest of it. I'd love to do it, but I haven't got the time. So it's just sort of seeing how we can um, help um, with some encouragement and with some promotion, really. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Paul, firstly, um, I'd like to thank you and, and uh, your department, etc., and the Council for providing a top-of-the-range boxing club and football club going on to your... Um, answer about sort of funding for these mm -hmm. things and, and this, these clubs, I mean there's 200 within the football club and about 80 in the boxing club and you know you provided a massive facility for that which is, it was amazing coming on to the youth centre um, when South Rysip Youth Centre was first opened, I can show you a picture of the, of the opening night where there was 200 kids waiting to get in there because the offering was all the things that we've got now but there was somebody running it that was passionate about the youth and music and all the things that is cool. Um, and then that person um, left because his job was up for grabs yeah. and someone else got it. And then you see the whole thing implode. And where we are now is the place is used by um, the autistic group and all sorts of other yeah. groups. But, but the, the place is in a mess. It's covered in old chairs and old videos and this, the basketball courts down, you know, and if we're not careful, the whole lot's going to look like a junk heap, Paul. Mm -hmm. And I've been on and on about this, mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've even, I think, written to, to council, well, I have written to council, but have given a list of all the things that need to be replaced, Yeah. you know, so we can get the kids in there. Yeah, I think you, you raised a, a couple of, you know, extremely valid points. I think, you know, as I sort of alluded to, before is that you know one of the challenges probably one of the biggest challenges we have is around retention of um, quality youth workers you know a for sort of opening the doors and, and uh, you know getting the uh, young people in but I think the, uh, the important bit is those relationships that the youth workers then establish um, you know one of the things that probably I didn't really pick up on is about um, the sort of links between universal and targeted is that what we have found where we've had those, those uh, sort of established, uh, you know, uh, let's say relationships, but where, you know, um, mm. young people feel confident 
with, uh, with the youth working team that we then found that there are some issues that, you know, they've, they've come to us as, you know, through the universal door, if you like. Um, but we've actually found that, you know, through the work that the, the staff have done, that there are some concerning issues. And that's when, you know, the universal team then have a conversation with the targeted team, and that's the route that, that's the door that they go through, you know, and, and get a bit more support. So having, you know, quality um, youth working staff and also to try and retain that youth working staff for the, the reasons that you mentioned there are so fundamentally important and that's one of the, you know that's our key challenge at the moment is try to do that the second point that you picked up about is the quality of offer and you know picking up um, Councillor Tuckwell's point about you know listening to young people and what they want so that's the sort of things that we're now putting together and, and obviously we're aware of the, the list that you've provided and, and that is now sort of add into that so you know I picked up about the um, the PS4s against Xboxes so all that sort of stuff is what young people are wanting so we're keen again that we want people to come and use our centres we don't want you know them to be put off because we haven't got the right facilities or the things that they want you know we've got that fantastic music system um, uh, DJ decks and all the rest of it there which is like state of the art and you know I can't understand why kids are, are, are not, you know, queuing up to have that opportunity, that experience. So we need to sort of a make them aware of it, then also encourage them, and then sort out some of the issues that you allude to. But the fundamental issue that we have um, is is uh, the retention of quality <coughs> quality youth workers. Mm -hmm. And I think you know part of the problem is, or part of the, the challenge is that, you know, for for the majority, we're providing an offer from what we refer to as twilight when the, the schools sort of finish until sort of nine o'clock um, in the evening so you know that's the core time that you, you want in your staff and that also then provides a bit of a challenge because you know some youth workers they only want to work up until a certain you know don't want to work that late and, and it's those sorts of things at the moment that we're trying to work through but the other point I'd also like to just, you know, picking up about your, your football, is that whilst we have challenges in our young people centres to, to encourage young people to use those facilities, sport, in particular football, has been a huge success. Youth football, boys, girls, across the borough, you see uh, our parks, um, the demand for our parks, the demand for local football teams is huge. You know, we're providing more and more football um, facilities, more and more football pitches. You know, we've invested in, in clubhouse facilities at Field End and also we moved um, a disused building down to Sipson um, for the football club to use there. And they were, you know, so, so grateful for, for having that opportunity. And it's, you know, so whilst we see decline in some areas, we've seen huge increases in, in others, the waiting lists on the, on the uniform groups, the huge groups on, on football. And with football, they won't turn anyone away. Um, they always... Uh, give them the opportunity uh, to have a kick about. Uh, they, they've got uh, from little tots from sort of five all the way up to sort of early teens. It does drop off a little bit and then picks up again in the seniors. But you know, sport is 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 a huge success uh, in in this borough for getting young people socialising, but also the health and wellbeing issues that uh, it also addresses. You know, there's kids turning up that haven't had breakfast because you know one thing or another and the football clubs are providing their breakfast um, before they play games and you know that's what we've seen down at Sipson and it you know it's a, it's a huge success our, our, our football provision our sports provision thank you councillor Rodriguez um, sorry one thing I know the young kids like is to play pool or snooker yeah. is, any, is any of those uh, clubs they have any pool tables or snooker tables yeah, or because they love it. Yeah, we've just, um, we, we just sort of uh, refurbished. We've got pool tables in, in most of the centres, I think all of the centres now, um, and we just refurbished um, most of them, if not all of them, I think. Um, we do have uh, some young people that unfortunately don't take as much care and, and then run a queue through the felt. But, um, yeah, no, those sorts of things are still very, very popular. So, you know, yes, you might have the computer games, but a simple game of pool or a game of snooker is still very popular and we, you know, provide those those facilities. So, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Councillor Sweeting. 
can I just make a comment about Northwood Youth Centre? Yeah. In March of last year, I did put in a member's inquiry asking why that centre was not open for business. And um, I've got the response here that it was concerning the, the damp. Yeah. And so we're nine months on and the damp is still there. So yeah, it's that's been just a comment. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think it, 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 is, it has been quite frustrating, to be honest, because, um, you know, it, it's been a, a, a sort of a, a long, ongoing issue. Um, I think uh, originally, you know, some quick fixes were considered, um, but, um, you know, they didn't work. And then on further investigation, the problem is a little bit, m well, it's a, it's, it's a huge problem now. Um, so it does need some fundamental changes. You know, not sure if it's uh, as a result of um, how the building was built or the way that the land around the back um, has been landscaped, which is obviously higher than the damp courses and, and all these sorts of things. So there's a number of challenges. It's got a fantastic dance floor in there and it's all popped up because the damp's got underneath, sort of rising damp, um, and the wood's just sort of buckled and bowed and come up. And, you know, when you walk in there, it, 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 it smells of mushrooms and uh, fungi. It's not very pleasant at all. But as I said, you know, the building team have, have tried some quick fixes. That hasn't worked. We've got the um, building surveyors in, the detailed specialists that have come in. They've now come up with a full detailed report. Um, so our team are, are a lot more informed now of what's uh, required, and they're putting things into place to, to get that work underway, hopefully as soon as possible. That actually wasn't my question. It was just a comment about. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, you know, it, I, 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 I sort of share your frustration, <laughs> councillor. That it's well. taking a long time, but it, as I said, it's you know, it's, it's just a lot more complicated than they first thought. Did you have your question, um, councillor? My question is about: um, Is there going to be a major review concerning youth services? Because we were not able to do a major review here in this in this committee because we were advised that a major review was actually taking place by the then Deputy Leader of the Council. Now, um, do we know whether that is proceeding now or what? I'm, un you know, cause I'm unaware of any, um, any full review. Um, you know, we've put um, together some suggestions about um, some ideas you know, around some of the things that I've described today um, that are, are sort of challenges from us from an operational perspective. There's something a bit more strategic. Um, I'm unaware of anything at the moment. I have. I yes. <laughs> Therefore, can I then suggest that we did look um, at having a major review on new services, and I hope that you would welcome that and the committee would welcome that, because there are some issues about funding, about the universal offer, about what our youngsters require and what is able to be delivered on a reduced budget. Mm -hmm. I have Councillor Markham next. Yes. Um, my understanding is there are, I think it's 53,000 youngsters at school in, in, in the borough. So to get 33,000 of them involved in the youth service is to be commended. I think the number of youngsters that Stuart's been talking about who need particular help, you could probably count in the dozens. So statistically, I think we're doing an incredibly good job uh, to involve youngsters to provide them with a really good service. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mavis. I'm very happy to dispute the numbers. Uh, the figure would be uh, a whole range of ages and uh, uh, not all from within the borough. But um, in, in terms of that group that, that is struggling, um, I suppose my question is this. So in terms of curriculum, there is a fantastic sports offer. I have no issue with that. There's a fantastic arts and creative offerings in some areas. And um, that isn't a youth, that's not universal youth work. And universal youth work, it seems um, that the department's approach is to, to see it as a leisure activity rather than the opportunity that youth work is in order to be an informal education. To take those young people who are on the street, who um, are potentially engaged in uh, negative things, or even just young people sat at home who aren't socially engaged or low in confidence, and to do what the adult um, learning service is doing and take them on a journey where they engage for a number of years and develop strong relationships of trust and, um, uh, and you know, flourish as they transition from child to adult. Uh, so I suppose 
the, the current structure of the youth service in the, in the universal offer is that it's run by youth support workers, so not qualified youth workers. Some may be, yeah. um, but, but sure. not by design. Yeah. Um, and that they're sessional workers or they are um, they're part time. There used to be a youth service in Hillingdon that was run by full time <coughs> workers who could build links in the communities, build links into the schools, follow that into the twilights in the evenings, and retention levels were higher. Do you think that that model or that structure of staffing is? the significant factor in my recruitment is so difficult. Because we've gone to a more uh, sessional staff than full-time staff. I think it's, a, it's, it's probably a difficult question to, to answer because I don't know all the information and we haven't really explored it into that, that sort of depth. I think what we've actually done is, is, is recruited staff to run programmes as and when required. Um, you know, some of the points that you, you picked up there, Councillor, you know, were probably a little more around the, the targeted side, you know, you, you know, about that sort of targeted provision where we've got young people that, you know, we're aware of that have challenges, shall we say, in their, in, in, in their world. Um, and obviously, the, you know, that's when the targeted provision then will start to, 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 to help them and, and to come up with sort of programmes around education, if you like, and, and other things. But to answer your question, you know, I don't know at the moment. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we run a, a timetable, we recruit to that timetable. Um, you know, if we had full time, if we converted all those staff to full time, you know, it's what they would do for the rest of their day um, would, would be a, a, a bit of a question. I think the other thing to sort of pick up on is that we're also aware of this uh, growing concern about social isolation during school holidays. Um, obviously, Fiesta does um, help with that to some degree, but obviously we're looking at um, some some ideas to sort of help address that as well, because we're you know we're aware that young people, whilst at school, get on with um, they have their mates, their friends, and everything else, but when they're on holiday, they seem to be distant from those for one reason or another. It could be you know um, those for those links those links sort of ever for you know what can be six weeks in the summer holidays so those young people may just be at home not engaging with anybody um, and not having any opportunity um, so you know it's uh, it's looking at what we can actually do to address that as well so that you know that's something that from my in my targeted gift if you like starting to, to look at and, and explore in a bit more uh, in a bit more depth thank you very much I, I'm very, thank you for the Mr. Chair. I'm um, very happy outside the meeting to talk about what youth workers can do to build up a whole programme in their community um, if they were full time, etc. It doesn't have to all be full time, but it just gives a, an idea of what a youth service could look like. Um, I suppose I'm looking at the, the kind of um, the, the curriculum within that and uh, thinking about that it's a long term relationship, getting young people through very similarly to the, the adult education but in an informal way. And uh, we spoke a little bit about the Youth Council and, um, and also what the, uh, the voluntary sector, the uniform organisations are doing and, and, and just the way that there is, uh, there is an offer out there and there is an opportunity to hear young people's voices uh, as is their right as a, as a child. But uh, I'm interested, it talks about active in the community and, um, and cites the groups that I've mentioned, but doesn't really talk about um, the, the, the universal youth offer in that regard or even the targeted youth offer. And so I'm just wondering what kind of strategies there are around how do we engage young people, not just in their views um, of their communities, uh, not just their views on services the council run for, for them or on behalf of their families, um, but how they can become active citizens. Um, there are things such as the National Citizen Service that um, deliver stuff for 15, 17 year olds, which is run by other providers, but, but it's about how do we encourage young people to be that next tranche of volunteers, maybe for the scouts and the uniformed organisations that we've mentioned, um, and what role the local authority can play in equipping a younger generation to be confident uh, as active citizens. Yeah, I think um, you know, what we're finding is that you know, where young people have a, a sort of an interest in that, then they're sort of following those particular routes. So, you know, we've got um, the police run a sort of a <coughs> a cadet, uh, a cadet uh, opportunity, as do the fire brigade, as well as all the uniform groups that we sort of talk about. So, you know, currently we don't do anything really to uh, to actively promote that. And again, with volunteers in sport, you know, a lot of that is happening through the clubs. So, a lot of the um, 
encouragement is, if you like, is, is, is coming through either their parents or, you know, their peers or themselves. <coughs> but that said, you know, again, you know, we can um, help promote that and encourage that um, and make people aware, because I think a lot of it is about um, being aware of what is on offer um, and those sorts of networks. The Duke of Edinburgh Award that we facilitate is, is, a fa you know, is, is, is again, a, a fantastic um, opportunity for young people. Um, you know, we hold the, the licence. Um, there was a, a sort of an idea from the Duke of Edinburgh um, Award body that um, they wanted to move that to schools but, um, and, uh, and the schools to run the programme. But in reality, that hasn't happened. That hasn't worked. That model hasn't worked. So it's, it's the local authority um, through... Um, you know, Maggie and my team that is, is sort of uh, encouraging that, um, actively promoting that. We've got more people uh, joining the, you know, onto the goal, doing the um, expeditions and all those sorts of fantastic opportunities, building their self-esteem, um, you know, getting those sort of social skills, um, soft skills. Um, so all of that sort of stuff is, 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 is there. So there's lots of opportunity that we provide. Um, but again, you know, it's difficult to sort of say how we bring those people to those opportunities. So, you know, maybe that's something we could sort of further explore. Um, but, you know, there is a lot out there that lots of people are doing, ourselves included, um, that, you know, would have sort of um, address some of the things that you sort of flagged up there. Um, if, Very this quickly. Is, if this isn't part of a, a major review uh, in the coming weeks, if, if I could submit some questions around how we could, or, or how the Youth Service Universal Office Targeted Secretary is advancing the informal education for young people in youth work, um, just so that we as a committee could have more information on, on the syllabus and the curriculum that is run. We can pass it through to Neil. And, yeah. um, I'm aware time is marching on, so I will bring this item to a close. I will take two more, Councillor Catherine, and I'll finish with Councillor Sweeting. Can you keep your questions and answers very brief, please, because time is moving on. Thanks, Chairman. Um, just going to your point, Paul, where um, you know, kids hang out at McDonald's or, or Subway or whatever, and a lot of kids these days just want to hang. They want somewhere just to hang out. So perhaps it might be an idea to put a food offering into the um, equation within the youth centre. Um, you know, McDonald's sign, I'm sure, would attract many young people. Thank you, Paul. Well, just a, as a, a quick uh, point on that, you know, we do have a tuck shop uh, in each of the, the young people centres, so. What we're trying to do is um, encourage them to stay in the building because one of the things that uh, they get uh, they get a little bit hungry and then they might all want to disappear across to the garage to get something to eat. So we do sort of put uh, a tuck shop shop in there. The other thing that we're doing is um, we do a number of because each of the sites has got a kitchen. So one of the things that we're doing is is uh, getting the, the young people to learn to cook. So you know they will sort of um, rustle up some pasta which they all sort of share. So you know those sorts of things are, are there. But, um, yeah, trying to get the kids out of McDonald's is still a challenge. Councillor Sweetie? Very quick question. What um, does the further two and a half million for youth provision actually comprise? Well, so from the budget? Yes. Well, <coughs> as you know, the um, at uh, West Drayton we've got the new leisure centre going in there, so we need to think about what we do with uh, young um, people's provision there. Um, so we need to look at uh, opportunities for the groups that are currently um, working out of um, out of that site. So as you know, we've got the, uh, the vehicle hub. Um, so we're looking at uh, a site to relocate them and provide um, resources uh, for them. Um, and we've also got um, uh, the looked after family Acorn um, facility as well. So we're looking at that. And also our young people's um, uh, centre, we're looking at uh, uh, sort of a, um, a new site for them as well. That was my follow-up. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you, Paul, for your attendance this evening. No problem at all, thank questions. you very much. Can I just say thank you for all the work that you and your team are doing on behalf of our young Okay, uh, item 10 is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Are there any comments or questions? Councillor Sweeting, you're studying it very carefully. Do you have any? <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, we've got, Could you use your um, microphone, please, Councillor Sweet? Okay. Um, there is a report going on uh, to, the, to the committee concerning um, the standards in education. Now, in the past, um, we've had that report comparing our statistical neighbours and London boroughs all over that report in various sections of that report and can I suggest that maybe that needs to be put in a table so that it, you don't have to go backwards and forwards through that report to see where we stand as a borough and make it much easier for us and our residents to understand where we stand. I, I can see Dan Kennedy nodding, I assume that's okay, yep, that's fine. Uh, in which case we'll note that. And item 11 is our work program. Questions, council members? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask a question? Will this POC and its areas be reviewed in line with any cabinet changes? I, I believe they will, the remit of the POCs will change in light of the cabinet portfolios, will it not? We can ask the question. Yeah, I'll have to find that out, Councillor. Yeah. And if I may just. Um, Chair, that, that we just consider youth services as part of the next major review. I know we look at that in April. It, it's in, yeah, as you said, it's in April and uh, all suggestions will be brought to that meeting, so one of that will be youth vision if you wish for it to be considered. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our business for this evening. Thank you very much for your attendance. The meeting is now closed at 5 to 9. Thank you. Mm -hmm.